Life Audio. You're listening to Therapy and Theology, and I'm your host, Carly McClear. This podcast is a space where we explore popular topics and questions related to the convergence of faith, feelings, spiritual formation, and more. My prayer is that through these conversations, we will grow in our awareness of who we are as beloved children of God, learn to acknowledge our needs and emotions with curiosity and compassion, and rediscover the purpose and power of our unique stories through the lens of the gospel. As a licensed therapist and ministry leader, I want to give voice to the many questions we face while cultivating a clearer view of how our faith informs our healing journey. I don't have all the answers, but I am committed to going deeper and walking together. So whether you've been to therapy or know exactly what you believe when it comes to theology, I want to invite you to join this journey as we fearlessly name the complexities of our present reality and press into the hope of the gospel story. So are you ready? Let's jump into today's question and begin this journey together. The ShopRite of Huntington is now open, owned and operated by the Greenfield family. With all the value and variety you love from ShopRite, visit the ShopRite of Huntington, just one mile south of Main Street in Huntington Village. ShopRite. Check out Happy. Christians should be serious about our faith. But does that mean we need to be serious people all the time? Especially in a world of weird, absurd stuff? And even when Christian culture gets crazy? I'm Barnabas Piper of the Happy Ramp Podcast, where we cheerfully rant about pop culture, church culture, work, creativity, life, and just about everything. But we take Jesus seriously. Listen and subscribe at lifeaudio.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Therapy and Theology. Today, I have the honor of having a guest in the studio with me today as we continue this series on singleness, sexuality, and spiritual formation. Josh Proctor works as the new resource creative at Posture Shift, a missiological ministry equipping the church leaders to enhance LGBTQ plus inclusion and care. He is also the creator and host of Life on Side B podcast, which explores the joys, beauties, and challenges of living according to the traditional sexual ethic as an LGBT plus Christian. Josh holds a bachelor's in Biblical Studies from Palm Beach Atlantic University, an MA in Old Testament and Hebrew from Nyack College, and is currently pursuing his MDiv from Karis University. Prior to joining the Posture Shift team, he was a ministry leader in the National Church Denomination in the country of Columbia for eight years. Currently, Josh lives in West Palm Beach, Florida with his chosen family, and in his spare time, you will find him doing one of three things— hanging with friends, watching Golden Girls, or going out dancing. So Josh, welcome to the show. I'm so grateful we get to have this conversation together. And I've been a listener of your podcast for some time. So I'm just so excited to have you join me today. I would love for us to start by hearing a little bit more about your journey to where you are now and how your interests and professional work intersect with this convergence of faith, feelings, and spiritual formation. Yeah. Well, first of all, hi, Carly. This is so exciting to be on here. I I say it every time I'm interviewed. I'm so used to having a podcast being on your end. So it's always new to adjust to being on the other opposite end. So I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. But yeah, so like about my journey to kind of condense it, I realized I was attracted to men very, very young, talking like elementary school age. Okay. And my family actually found out about it around that same time. And I've been all over the map on reconciling faith and sexuality. When my parents first realized that I was attracted to men, they took me to like ex-gay ministry, conversion therapy stuff. And I went through that multiple times in my life. I also went through periods of leaving faith altogether, just going, this is ridiculous, can't do this. Mm -hmm. And then also having times of Uh, Really, when I came back to faith after that time of kind of leaving faith altogether, I had really just gotten to a place of, uh, I mean, you would say an affirming position, but just kind of going, God, I just need you to love me how I am. And I I don't want to have to 
think through things for that. I just need to be loved in this moment. Yeah. Regardless of anything. And that was kind of really where I was at when I came back to faith. And then I, I think it's just been as I've slowly developed in my relationship with God and kind of came to a delved into scripture and everything, I've came to a bit more of what I call a side B position, which I know we'll probably get into some of that stuff later. Yeah, yeah. But in general, what I, I normally say that I came to a theology of community rather than a theology of marriage because I I I love that. Really came to a place of going, yeah, okay, I hold to a view that marriage is between a man and woman, sure. But I really became came to a theology where I thought that marriage was being decentered, that there was more of an understanding of kingdom family, of what family looks like in God's kingdom. And I was like, oh, I it's that. not it's a lot more than marriage. Like that's mm-hmm. a, maybe a small little part of it, but there's a lot more to it. So really began to explore what, like this whole thing of kingdom family, what does kingdom family look like? How do I live out? And so kind of living this complex, you know, understanding in that as a queer person and then kind of going, okay, if I'm I'm not going to find a husband and or a wife because of either theological conventions or sorry, can't just <laughs> Or actually, All right. All right. then what am I going to do? So, yeah, it's been like, that's literally the shortest condensed version I can tell that's not going to last uh, last us here for 10 hours. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but I, but uh, I think it's been really cool to see how, I, honestly, even in all of those crazy waves and movements, God has been there. Even in the moments when I was like, screw faith, I'm done. Like, even being able to look back and see God was working in the midst of those moments and making his presence real, but then kind of connecting it to my professional work through a lot of my journey, I had gotten to a place of going, I don't really want to deal with this topic. Like, you know, for us queer people, it can just get so burdened down because there's this pressure to get everything figured out. Yeah. And if you don't get it figured out and you're not where people want you to be, then they get mad and all of this kind of stuff, community builds on it, all of these things. So I had really for a long time gotten to a place of going, okay, well, I'm just like not, I I don't know, I'm not touching it. I'm not talking about it. I'm living for Jesus according to my convictions and that's it. Like, yeah. But then two things really happened. One was the Pulse nightclub shooting, which, as you said, I'm in Florida Mm -hmm. and I went to Pulse, you know, multiple times before the shooting happened. And for anyone who doesn't know, I'm just... The Pulse nightclub shooting was a shooting that happened in a nightclub in Orlando, Florida during Gay Pride Month, which I think is still the second deadliest shooting in the country's history. Uh, wow. Nine people died. Countless more were wounded. And so that really hit me because it was especially an air place that I had been to before. And yeah, I just felt God kind of saying your community needs you like your family needs you. And I'm like. I'm going to do at the time I was living in Columbia, South America. Okay. And I'm like, I'm not even in Florida. Like what <laughs> am I doing this? And then later on for um, some stuff, I was in New York and I was kind of walking around. I, lo- I love a lot walking around New York City. Mm-hmm. And I was in Hell's Kitchen, Chelsea kind of area, which is predominantly the queer area of New York City. And while I was there, I noticed that I didn't really see any churches visible mm-hmm. at the time, at least where I was at. Um, not to say there weren't there, but I just didn't see any visible. I'd see them all over the place everywhere else. And I took this to actually someone I was talking with, uh, a professor for a class I was taking. And I was like, this is just really bothering me that, of course, in the queer area, there's no churches. And he was like, well, queer people don't want the gospel. And I was like, first of all, that's wrong. Second of all, <laughs> right. Ouch. Oof. <laughs> second of all, Why would you say then you're not going to go? Like we do this with every other community in the world. Like we go, we share the gospel, we share that it's good news. And I think that just lit a fire underneath me, first of all, to make churches safe, to make churches see the importance of reaching queer people and making our churches safe in this way. But then on top of that, really working with queer people to in this area, I think that's why spiritual formation has become a really big thing for me. That's what my doctorate is working on. Like that's where I'm at in that. But really wanting to look at what is holistic spiritual formation related to sexuality and all of these things. So 
that's a little bit about me and like kind of how this came into my work and and all of that. Awesome. No, I love t- both sides of that from a personal perspective of, you know, can we look past the, I would say, predominant Christian view of marriage and and family and even looking beyond that to scripture to see how family is so diverse and complex and not our American family picture that we have. I think that's beautiful. And then to to be able to see the connection it brings to reaching those that we align with and then those that maybe are on, on the other side of this conversation that maybe need some education and, and some compassion. So in the previous episode, I talked through discussing our sexual ethics as a whole, what scripture says about our bodies as divine and sexual beings and the brokenness that impacts sexuality in general because of the fall and the formation of honoring God with our bodies. But today, Josh and I are going to look and talk specifically about the topics that arise in both therapy and in church settings surrounding our theology on LGBTQ issues. So I want to set up a framework for this as we dive deeper into this topic today, because I think for many in this conversation, either it's either not widely talked about in Christian settings or not understood from a personal level. And then in many ways, I think it's very connected to either feelings of judgment, fear and shame. So with that being said, and Josh, you can certainly add your initial thoughts on this too, but I'd love to have you give us some language around this sensitive topic and how it relates to the wide ranges of stances that we're seeing today and the theological interpretations within the LGBT plus Christian community. Hi, I'm Beckett Cook, host of The Beckett Cook Show. I lived as a gay man in Hollywood for many, many years until I had a radical encounter with Jesus 13 years ago. Since then, I've gotten my master's degree in seminary and published a book called A Change of Affection. On my podcast, The Beckett Cook Show, I sit down with fascinating Christian scholars and thinkers to address the lies of the culture and bring the biblical truth to bear on those lies. To start listening now, go to lifeaudio.com or search for The Becca Cook Show on your favorite podcasting platform. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, as you said, there's there's a wide range of beliefs in this among the LGBTQ Christian community, especially. And I think a lot of it comes down to that as our culture has shifted, you know, because we like to put the the hurt of the queer community specifically on the church. It, but we also have to remember that just a few decades ago, it wasn't just the church. It's been the broad community culture that yeah, has really marginalized the LGBTQ community and hurt the LGBTQ community at large altogether. And really, though, as we've seen a culture shift, you know, towards seeing the harm that has been done towards LGBTQ people, the church has held on to a lot of fear of what to do. And I think that's really stalled the church from really being able to both confront the hurt that we have caused and to see how we can care better, even within our theology and all of this stuff, because we have feared that in order to confront those things, then we have to let go of our theology. Right, right. And I think what that has caused is it has caused for a lot of LGBTQ people to have to process this stuff on their own. Like we don't normally have people to walk with us beyond unless you can find another queer person. Mm -hmm. So I think because of that, there's been language that has fostered within the LGBTQ community and all of that in order to kind of walk alongside this ourselves because of that. So some of the language that I many times will use is what we call the sides terminology. Mm -hmm. This is, you've already talked to, I already kind of mentioned it with side B. This kind of language, it's, it's not used by everyone in the queer community, but, and there's been some critiques back and forth on how helpful it is or how not helpful it is and all of this different kind of stuff. The main idea is that it's meant to foster conversation in, especially it was developed in, I think like the nineties or 2000s, somewhere around that area when there was a lot of culture war around gay marriage and mm-hmm. people just wanted to be able to have language that de-escalated the conversation from a political mindset and really be able to give that within the community. So, a few other notes before I kind of explain the different kind of perspectives on it. Yeah. A lot of these views are specifically on the topic of sexuality. They do not touch on the topic of gender identity. Okay. So you will have a people from all over 
the spectrum of views on sexuality that held, held very differing views on gender identity and transitioning and all of those things around the trans conversation. And there, it's not comprehensive within each side. You'll have a wide range of views. Uh, so I, mean, I hold the Life on Side B podcast and just within the Side B conversation, there's a wide range. Wide range. Yes, yes. Wide range. So there is diversity. And one of the critiques that I, I just always like to mention it beforehand that people kind of go is they'll either say, well, they'll either say with the sides that, oh, this is like pitting queer people against each other or it's minimizing our differences kind of thing. Like it's just making it out like you get an option in between them when these are deep theological differences that we sometimes have. Yeah, none of sure. Again, none of it was meant to do that. It's not meant to quote, pit queer people against each other nor to minimize difference of theological beliefs. But well, uh, it's really just to foster conversation. And that's an incomplete situation, but it's what we got right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So with all of that, like oh, a lot of the ways that we normally talk about the broad theological views among queer people is you have what we call side A, which stands for, um, I mean, it's normally generally the affirming position that you believe God blesses same-sex sex, sexual relationships. And even within that, there will be a wide range of views of, do you believe that sex is reserved for marriage? Do you believe it's not? All of those kinds of things. But the general idea of side A is that you believe God ordains same-sex sexual relationships and blesses them. I also have side X, which stands for kind of the ex-gay um, perspective that you believe that God wants you to change your sexual orientation in order to follow him, that even the attraction, the orientation itself is sinful and therefore you need to pursue becoming heterosexual and probably marry someone uh, of the opposite sex, ultimately, that marriage is the ideal mm -hmm. in those things. And then there is a term for uh, perspective, what we call side Y. I'm very hesitant to use the term side Y because no one actually okay. in the camp actually uses that term for themselves Okay. in any way. So I normally call it kind of no identity, but in Christ kind of group where there the idea is, well, your attractions don't need to change. You don't need to necessarily become straight, but anything connected to the queer experience beyond just admitting your attractions is you need to let go of like not identifying as gay, not engaging in queer culture, those kinds of things. Um, normally, it's not just from a personal view, but believing that all LGBTQ people, you know, need to renounce that and go to that. And then side B, which is the like the camp that I'm in, is the view that, okay, yes, marriage is reserved, like sex is reserved for marriage between a man and a woman, mm -hmm. but that obviously queer people in there like that, it's not a sin to be gay. It's really just how we steward our relationships, how we steward our sexuality in this way that God calls us to celibacy or marriage or, or intentional community and all of these things. With inside B, you'll have people that do engage in queer culture, others that don't, some that use queer terminology, others that do not. Right. But it's just that general kind of really holding the tension space of admitting, yeah, we're queer. Like This is the reality of my life. <laughs> it's culture. But I still hold to what I believe on, on marriage and community and sexuality. So then yeah. trying to figure out how do I reconcile those within that framework. So there's a lot of that in there. And, and again, it's kind of one of those things of, you're going to have people all over the spectrum. Some people won't use those terminologies to share their beliefs. Um, and I'm a very big person. I like, I, I don't want to, I, I want to communicate with how a person would identify their beliefs. But I, I believe that this has been like the best framework so far that we've had that kind of shares the broad spectrum of theological views in the queer community. Awesome. I love that. And yeah, I was introduced to the sides only a few years ago, and it really put language yeah. to for me personally, and then also for my clients, because I, I see a lot of young women that are navigating this topic in their lives, a younger and younger, and there isn't a lot of, yeah. there isn't a lot of, of language. And like you said earlier, oftentimes, unless you have another person who identifies as queer or is really educated on like what scripture says and wants to walk with you in that it's like a we don't touch we don't talk about it we don't touch it because we don't know yeah. and i think that's the challenge is the church and what i've seen historically is that the church doesn't know really how to say it and if they say it they say it hurtfully <laughs> and so they just haven't they just say oh well we can't touch it because we have to pick a side and so i think that's in this sense why the 
the side's language has been really helpful yeah. to give kind of a, a broader perspective and maybe a path to walk. Yeah. Um, and so in this idea, so first speaking maybe to those in this community, reconciling you know, our faith with our sexual attractions or gender identities can be very painful, disorienting. Uh -huh. And there tends to be a crossroads of faith where many feel like either God no longer, longer loves them if they they just accept that they have attractions to the same sex or that God wants them to somehow, like you said earlier, become heterosexual, be, become married to the opposite sex yeah. or heal to follow him faithfully. And, you know, I see this, this breaks my heart in, in, in my work with clients because so often there is a, well, I have to walk away from God because I'm gay, you know, and, and there's this, such this challenge of how do we reconcile the two? And I've asked, you know, my clients, like, how did you know, like, tell me more about your story, just getting to understand them. And oftentimes it's, well, you know, I read the lesbian manifesto on online or like, they, there's just no connection between this identifying what we believe and how we can talk about our feelings openly. And so I just love for you to share a little bit more about your initial encouragements or maybe even just a word that you would give to those questioning. Maybe they haven't even come out or acknowledged their same-sex attraction or who openly identify within the LGBTQ community and feel this tension of faith and feelings. Yeah. Yeah, no, this is this is something whenever I talk to people that write in to Life on Side B or in that place, there's a few things that I always say to people who are in that journey of reconciling faith and sexuality is, first of all, there's no timeline. Like there's yeah. no ticking time bomb that's going to go off if you don't get this done in time. Like, and just allowing yourself the peace of that, like the peace to understand. Like I remember in my journey when I was deciding, I'm going to sit down and figure out what I believe, you know, in sexuality and faith. At the beginning, I felt this pressure like, yeah, okay, I have six months <laughs> figure this out. <laughs> and I remember just coming to a place of like, I don't have to like I was living out my sexuality as I felt like in the midst of it, God had called me to. But I was like, I have an, a, a lifetime to kind of really delve into this. And I would say even as I've like solidified my thoughts on a few questions, I'm still like you never stop reconciling, you never stop learning and growing and deepening. So it just becomes a continuation of that, even after you get like specific questions that we really love answered about, like, what do you believe on marriage kind of thing? So there is no timeline. I would also say that it's really important to start with the understanding that God's love is not based on you. And I think that goes to a lot of different ways. Like we get such into a, like a self-centered, honestly, way of understanding God's love that it's based on what I do. It's based on these things. It's based on who I am. But it's ultimately not, and that's the crazy part of Christianity, that it, it is based on God, God alone. It literally has nothing to do with me, and God just delights in me because I am God's child. That's right. And so I think that that's the first thing that I think is really hard for queer people to like grasp because of the ways that we have been told that God hates us, that God can't love us well as we are, and all these kinds of things. Yeah. And so I, I think that that is always a good place and normally the last encouragement I really give to queer people when they're going through this is if you really emphasize just wanting to follow Jesus and listen to the spirit, you're not going to go wrong. Like okay. getting, get in the word, follow Jesus, listen to the spirit. And if you seek after him, you will find him. Like it is that simple in those ways. And yeah, I, just give that encouragement because that is the encouragement that Jesus gives to us in scripture, that if you seek me, you will find me. And so that's where I just kind of go examine your heart and follow after him. And it will happen. Like he is faithful in those ways. He might show up differently than you thought he would. Uh -huh. He will show up. And so I think being able to find that peace in those moments of that, like God is not going to abandon me. God loves uh -huh. And that there is no timeline on this, like that we are called to love Jesus as our king. Uh -huh. And that has to be our primary focus. And I even know for me, sometimes when I was going through it, I, I multiple times went through periods where I was like, you know what? I have to set this question aside <laughs> and it's not important, but I think I've be, made this my idol. I've made this my God 
And obviously, I still need to follow faithfully in my sexuality as best as I know in this moment. Sure. But I need to focus on understanding Jesus as my savior and my resurrected king. I need to focus on that because I've stopped focusing on that and I've just become consumed with question. So, yeah, give yourself breaks, like allow time to go. You know what? I've really focused on this and I'm almost worried I'm making this an idol. So let me go focus on just Jesus for a period and then I'll come back to it. So, those, yeah, those are some things that I just think are really important as we go through and process this in it to allow that peace in it as you process. Yes. Oh, I love that so much. All of those things. I feel like so often this, this language around healing, not that God can't heal, not that we can't experience that and in graces that he gives us yeah. in our lives. But I think there's this challenge and I see this on, on maybe people that have been really hurt by this dialogue of, uh, you know, you just want me to change or, you know, you just want the God wants me to heal and healing means my attractions go away and not always. That's not always what it means. Yeah. And I think that that is the challenge is even in my own process of, of walking through this in my own story of being able to acknowledge that grace is not necessarily a resolve of attraction or of the pain or the experience. Like you said, we're constantly, it's, sanctif it's sanctifying. It's, yeah. you know, daily. And in that same sense, it's recognizing that grace is actually like you're saying, God's sustaining power in our lives. And so to have that, we have to be with him and develop that that formation process. And I think that's that's been so helpful to me of like grace and time and space. I, I had one mentor of mine, I was freaking out. Like you said, like we have to have the answers right now. Yeah. <laughs> and um, one of my mentors said to me, Carly, just, just learn to float. <laughs> just like be still and and see how God meets you there. And I think that was, probably the best thing someone could have said to me at that moment. And so I love that, that that is still something that I come back to when questions get too big or when even just in general life and sexuality as a single person is just challenging. And so we have to continually reconcile like, Lord, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. What is this about? And how do I honor you with it? How do exactly. you see you as king? Yeah. And it's like, we always have to keep growing. Like you can't put off growth. You can't just go, okay, well, I'm just going to stay here. Right, right. Like, but at the same time, when we get so focused on it that we can't be at peace in the moment, that's the moment when we're like, okay, yeah, I need to take a break because I'm all there. Growth is never going to stop. Like that's things right. that I'm going to have to learn and grow and come to terms with and reconcile. It's never going to stop after this thing. It's going to be another thing and another thing after that. And so if I can't find peace in the midst of those things, even as I grow, then I'm not going to have peace in my life at all, you know? And so, yeah, it's just so important to be able to live in those moments of, like, it's what we're in, the, the already not yet kingdom. Like, yes. the kingdom has come, but it's not yet here. We live in this tension of understanding, of questions, of, like, all of this stuff. And so, and Jesus calls us to live for him in the midst of that. Um, and so I think this is one of those aspects of it. So good. Yeah. So in light of that, what would you see as some maybe significant needs, both emotionally, socially, and then even spiritually for the LGBTQ community? Yeah, this is like kind of an area where I'm really getting into with my doctorate stuff, which I love. Yeah, yeah. A lot of fun to delve into this because I think there are multiple things. Obviously, I think one of the biggest things initially that a lot of queer people have to confront is the issue of shame. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's something that we all deal with, no, that's with like kind of struggling with it. I think in the area of queer shame, this idea that God cannot love me because of the thing like I have to hide this part, you know, and I, I think that's where the the process of coming out is really important. I kind of we we talk about the process of coming out like I'm making a big announcement or I'm telling everyone in my life that I'm queer. And actually, that's not what I'm really talking about. Okay. What I call what the press of coming out is a process of reintegration. Because yes, yes. the idea before we come out is the idea is that we have two sides of ourselves. We have this internal side of what we understand of ourselves. And we have the side that everyone sees. We have to integrate those two sides. That might be through telling people. That might be through telling some friends or, or however it might look. But it's the process of integrating 
and allowing God and others to see ourselves for who we are and like what the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it. That's right. And then being able to receive love in the midst of that. And so I think that in that way, we are able to see the dignity that God has, like that we have from God in our lives as queer people, as people, as people made in the image of God. And so it, when we can be seen as the messy humans we are, and I'm not saying we're messy just because we're queer. I'm just saying <laughs> right, in general, all messy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we all messy. So when we can be able to be seen as the messy human and be able to be loved in the midst of that, we can be able to see the dignity of being made in the image of God, but yet being broken people Yeah. in that. So I think that the shame, especially the queer shame of believing that I am unlovable because I am queer, I am unlovable because of whatever right. it might be, when we can be able to confront that and see that both people and God can see us as queer and still love us, we can be able to pursue that dignity I think a few other things that I would talk about is there is definitely a process of confronting joy and resentment that has to go through because there's so many ways that we've been hurt by the church or by culture or by family. And a lot of this can build up pain, just a lot of pain. And with the resentment part, you know, there's an phrase i can't remember who said it but that anger is the bodyguard of sadness Mm -hmm. i like to kind of switch it and say anger is the bodyguard of hurt Mm -hmm. and i think that being able to confront those two things the sorrow and like actually not confront it but i think with the sorrow it's like actually embracing the sorrow so that through that we can find joy and then being able to let go of the resentment to get into gratitude because there's just so much hurt that goes into being a queer person in faith circles, regardless if you grew up in church or if you came to faith later on, I promise you, you're going to interact with people that don't understand, that say awful things, do awful things, Yes, going to get rejected in different ways. And this is going to build, if we are not intentional in our formation as queer people, it will build up walls that block people out and block God out. And so I think the process of finding joy through sorrow and being able to pursue gratitude and forgiveness in place of resentment is so important for ourselves, not even, you know, for others. And I think then one of the other ones that I would mention, there's a few like I like there's a bunch we could obviously go on. Sure. Yeah. (laughs) But I think the other one is finding pursuing intimacy, finding what intimacy looks like. The one thing I always. Yeah talk about when I do spiritual care for LGBT people is I don't care what side you're on. I don't care what your beliefs are. All of us have to answer the question, who will be there when I'm 80 years old? So I don't care if you're married, single, in an intentional community, whatever, whatever your situation is, we all have to answer the question, who's going to be there when I'm 80 years old to care for me and love me? And we have to find that. And I think that obviously intimacy is not just with humans, but also with God and I think that this kind of connects to that shame thing of we can't have intimacy without being fully known. So we have to confront the shame in order to find intimacy. Then we also do have to ask those questions about like, what does that look like for me? Because I I think that there's a process for us queer people that because we've spent so much time in the closet of hiding, of living this double life of like this one side that everyone sees and this one side that's in life that's in the closet there's this process of constantly there's a natural progression of creating a double self. Yeah. I'm um, sure. always because that's been our since our childhood. We yeah. lived in the closet. So I think that in so many ways, even sexual integrity of being able to bring harmony between our ideal self and, and who we are at this moment, being able to understand that we might not be living up to our beliefs. All of these things are really important in order to be able to be seen and to grow, because if we can't come to an understanding of who we are in this moment, then we cannot face in order to grow in those ways. So those are just some of the things that when I do spiritual care with queer people and like what I'm doing with my doctorate, kind of going in to, yeah, looking at intimacy, shame, sorrow and and resentment, and how do we confront these very painful areas of our life and scary parts? Because the question of who's going to be there when I'm 80 years old is a scary thing. When you're single and celibate and like, I don't know what to do with this, especially if you're like side B or more like, you know, traditional believing where you're like, well, marriage is not really an option. So what's that going to look like for me? 
yeah, and I think that even aligns with anyone who's single yeah. and following Jesus. Like we don't have a good ethic or formation around anything outside of marriage in the family unit. And not to say that that marriage in the family isn't beautiful and God ordained, but we live in a broken world where some people don't get married, even if they don't identify as queer. And so I think that that's also something that is encouraging for those that are listening that maybe don't identify, but also have the same ache of singleness and celibacy and saying, okay, where am I finding that intentional community and that intimacy? Yeah. And how am I, how am I breaking free of the shame that says I'm not enough and that's why I'm not married or that's why God hasn't healed me, et cetera. And yeah. I think that can be really important for us to acknowledge that in general. Yeah. And I think that's where we can look at what is that kingdom theology? Like what is that kingdom community? Because I think when we see Jesus, we see Jesus live out a community that doesn't look like what we would normally in modern, you know, Christianity pose as, you know, the normal family unit. And so I think when we can do that, and when we can embody that more. And I think there's just, there's so many ways that in our modern society, it's just really hard to do that because I, I, I could go on critiquing our modern society. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, between social media of this fake intimacy that we have of, I have friends across the country, which is great, but then it stops us from having intimacy locally, as well as this whole culture of like, I drive 20 minutes to where I'm going to go, which in other cultures where you walk, you have community with people, your neighbors and the people you walk around. But we have this, we haven't, we're such an isolated community in many ways. We're an isolated culture. So it takes 10 times more intentionality to fight against the isolation of the fact that when I go to a place, I'm not walk like when I lived in Columbia and I walked on the street, I made friends with everyone, like people that you just walked by and like you made friends as you walked by. And sometimes it kind of got annoying because you're like, I have an appointment and I need to go. <laughs> but us who we drive, you know, so far for our cars and, and we connect with people on social media, we get the false intimacy of thinking of connecting with people, but not. And so I just think there's these ways of figuring out, like, we can't change our culture in this way. Like, well, this is the culture we live in. Sure. But how do I intentionally make sure I'm finding intimacy and how do we as a church do that in a way? Yeah, that's so good. And that leads us kind of to the other side of this important conversation, right? Is how the church and Christians specifically can care and support those in their lives, whether that be a child or a spouse or a friend or a sister or a brother, or just someone in their community to navigate the complexities of faith and LGBTQ issues. I think that this is such a challenging thing. And, I, and you have such an incredible stance on this because of the work that you do. And so tell us a little bit more about Posture Shift and, and maybe some simple steps or advice, maybe you could say, to give families and church leaders so that they can enhance the LGBTQ inclusion and care. Yeah. So Posture Shift is a missiological ministry. We work with churches and, and parents to enhance church inclusion and increase family acceptance, minimize victimization of LGBT people and nurture faith identity. Those are like our four vision statement. And we are working with churches to help take a missiological perspective of seeing the LGBTQ community as an underage people group, like any other people group. And how do we do that? Then we take on a missionary perspective and reach culturally, contextually, of contextualizing the gospel as missionaries do all over the world into what this looks like for queer people. So we do that with trainings of churches. And then we also work with parents in order to help them love and accept their child. Normally after they come out or through whatever process might be happening, we create resources like Guiding Families of LGBT Loved Ones, which is our book. We're working on the new edition of that coming out, which has been a really good resource that we give to parents and pastors that We've seen a lot of success on when we can get parents that are kind of on the fence of even really maintaining a relationship with their children after coming out, that when we can get them to read this book, there becomes a high increase of acceptance and love within families on that. And that's the main thing. We just want to, we want to create space and be able to do this in a way that helps churches and parents find a way to still maintain their theology, but yet see that loving their child, loving queer people in their church and honoring God faithfully do not have to be at odds with each other. Yeah. That we can have this both reality in that. 
And so if talking to church leaders specifically, I would say one of the greatest things is to start pursuing getting trained. Like if you go to postureshift.com, like you can see a lot of great stuff there on how to get trained on a few more like other like small things that I think are doing. I think, I think the education part is just so important. I feel like us in the church setting, like this conversation changes so often, like it's so rapidly developing that even I, where this is like my work, I have to intentionally like, you know, be growing and learning and all of this. So I think that we in the church, we're just even so far behind in understanding like language and all of these different kinds of things, yeah. let alone how to care for people. So I think that have being intentional about education, getting trained in those kinds of things is really important. I think the other thing kind of connects to that community side, like we've been talking about. I really, really think one of the biggest things churches need to do in order to make space for queer people. But this, as we talked about, this is not just queer people. It's anyone who fits outside yes. of the nuclear family unit yep. that realizes that, hey, the nuclear family unit doesn't work for me. Like it doesn't it doesn't fit my situation. Whatever reason, I can't like make that happen. We have to do the painstaking work of making community more than Sunday morning at church or for families, because so much of it has developed around that. I even like ended up intentionally looking for a church. I was like, I wanted to be in a church where it wasn't just centered on nuclear families and where it was a community that I could know the people in my church outside of a Sunday morning. Yeah. Because I had gotten just really tired of only having church community on Sunday morning. I wanted people that I could know outside of that. And so I, I think that that's a very, very hard to change that culture. But I think it's something we have to do because I don't think that the church culture um, church community was meant to either be something just for Sunday mornings or as well just for nuclear family. Right. I think that some of that can be through different things like encouraging families, whether nuclear families or whatever, that have an extra room to like, you know, allow that room for someone else in the church who might need it, like need a room, like a single person or something like that, encouraging these like intentional communities in many ways through the people of our church uh, to share life together, to make ways that it's not just families that we're caring about. When we look at what our ministries are, all of our ministries, couples ministries, men, women, and children ministries, because if so, then we need to, we need to work on that. <laughs> yeah, um, good. Because I feel like then right. there's this concept of if you're single, up until you're 30, then you're, you have a place. And then after 40, <laughs> you true. just have to figure it out because no longer yeah. in the young adults group anymore. Um, where do we fit now? You know, where, where do we fit now? Um, so yeah. I think we have to really look at this yeah. because if we don't, then it's, we're not going to make space. Yeah. Oh, I love that. It's so true. I see that in my locally where I live and even in the church communities and my church works really hard at creating multi-generational and diverse families in our groups, because it's true. We, we all need a place to, to be family. Uh, and yeah. what that looks like is not all single people over here and all married people over here, but being able to mix and see the roles and the gifts that we each bring to the, the family of God. So absolutely, thank you. Uh, this, this has been a great conversation. And before we close, I would love for you to just share a little bit more about your podcast yeah. And how you've seen God use life on side B to support, encourage others. And then maybe if you had any other resources or encouragement for people to get educated, or you've mentioned a few already on faith, sexuality, and gender, I'd love for you to share that too. Yeah. So life on side B, I'm shocked that it's developed into what it is. It, it literally more started with me wanting to have conversations and friends saying, hey, I would love to hear that. And I'm like, sure, I'll record it. Yeah. Why not? But so life on side B is where we discuss what it's like to be a queer person who holds your traditional view and how do you live that out. So I have a co-host team of me and five other people. Awesome. We are a crazy co-host bunch, <laughs> but we I do love all of them. And every season we have a theme that we're looking to explore. Right now we're going through resilience and what does it look like to be resilient in our faith as queer people. And we just interview people on different topics of that. So I've I've really loved it. It has been a huge blessing. And like I said, I, I really did not think it was going to grow into what, to what it has, but it's been an honor to see what God has been doing in it. 
of even just the letters that we receive, you know, sometimes when I'm like, does anyone listen to this? Like, is there anything the coming from this? <laughs> yeah. It's really cool to see stories of people going like, I literally thought I was the only person kind of processing this. And now, you know, this has been helpful for parents. You know, like we we really gear our podcast towards queer people. Like we always say everyone's really welcome to listen. We love all of it. We really try to make the space for queer people. But even just being able to see parents that have been able to listen and help understand their kids or pastors who have listened and been able to really gain creative understanding on how to make space. So it's been one of the biggest things of any time I go through that point of like going, we just need to end this. I'm done. Um, then <laughs> God shows another thing. I'm like, oh, this is worth doing. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And for other resources that I um, would recommend, there's there are a lot of great stuff. I, I would say if since we kind of talked about the emotional, spiritual, social needs of stuff, if kind of if you're wanting more resources on like the shame and intimacy and all those kinds of things and sorrow, a really good book that just came out is Tenderness by Eve Tushnet. I think the subtitle is Releasing Rejection and Embracing God's, something about God's love, you know. But Eve, who's a gay Catholic, does an amazing job at just really talking about all of these areas of emotional, social and spiritual needs and stuff. So I think that would be a really good book if any of that kind of area Awesome. Interests you more in that Revoice, obviously, uh, Revoice is a conference for Side B Christians, has a lot of great stuff as well. And there's a bunch, there's some other ministries. Kaleidoscope is a ministry based out of New York that also has some great stuff as well. So uh, there's the good thing is, it's like resources are so much more than they ever used to be. Yeah, for sure. There's a lot of great books that have since come out, a lot of great ministries that are doing great work. And so, any of those are really good. But yeah, those are some different things that if you're wanting also more stuff to learn, um, I would say those are especially as a queer person, those those last resources I mentioned are really good if you're a queer person looking for some more information as well. Awesome. Well, thank you. I will link those in the show notes. And Josh, thank you so much for coming on the show. It has been such a pleasure and an honor to talk with you today and to glean from you. I'm so thankful for your leadership in these conversations. And I just hope that God continues to bless you and your ministry. Thanks so much. Thank you for inviting me on. This has been an honor. I appreciate it. Certainly. Glad to have be here. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of Therapy and Theology. If you have a question or topic you would like discussed on a future episode, please feel free to email me or drop it in the comments. Also, don't forget to subscribe to have each week's episode instantly downloaded to your podcasts and see the show notes for resources mentioned in this episode. To access more content and join my monthly email list for the latest updates and info, visit my website at carlymarkleer.com. Why are Christians always so serious? I'm Barnabas Piper of the Happy Rant Podcast, where we take Jesus seriously, but not too much else. Subscribe at lifeaudio.com.